Hey guys, today I'll show you a horror thriller TV series named American Horror Story Season 7 Cult. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The drama begins with Donald Trump's election as the 45th President of the United States. Trump's rise to power was a mix of joy for some and despair for others. For instance, the guy with blue hair named Anderson was over the moon. But this lady, Allie, was the polar opposite. She was utterly distressed. Upon learning of Trump's victory, she even broke down in tears. Why such a stark contrast between the two? Well, they had their reasons. Allie is a lesbian with a partner, and together they have a child, likely adopted. She feared that Trump's presidency could usher in laws unfavorable to same-sex couples, possibly tearing them apart. That's why she was particularly averse to Trump's administration because many of Trump's supporters are known for their homophobia and sexism. So naturally, they were thrilled with his election, including Anderson, who even painted his face orange, Trump's signature hue. Also feeling the impact was Winter, Anderson's sister. After making a pact, Winter confessed that she was really scared now, but Anderson reassured her that she was not alone. This goes to show just how significant the American election is to the citizens of the United States. The scene shifts to the notorious killer, Twisty the Clown, who's supposed to have died in the freak show, but he is killing again. It turns out it's a comic book adapted from his story that a boy named Oz is reading under the covers. This Oz is the son of Allie and her partner, Ivy. Allie, discovering that Oz is still awake and reading, orders him to go to sleep. She then takes the comic book from his hands, glances at it, and immediately falls apart, almost fainting. It turns out that Allie has a severe case of coulrophobia, the fear of clowns, which had almost been cured until Trump's election seemingly rekindled her phobia. Elsewhere, Anderson, representing a small group, is in a debate with government officials. He asserts that people need to feel fear, need to be frightened, because only when they are scared will they forget their other desires, and society will remain stable. A councilman retorts that this kind of attitude will only lead to more chaos. With biting sarcasm, he says that with Trump in power, pests like Anderson think they can infiltrate society, but actually they should be afraid instead. He then tells Anderson to get lost. The councilman happens to be Allie's neighbor. Anderson leaves with a warning saying a humiliated person is very dangerous. Meanwhile, Allie visits a psychologist and shares her increasing anxiety. It turns out she's not only afraid of clowns, but also suffers from claustrophobia, tripophobia, and hemophobia. Honestly, it's a wonder how someone with so many phobias manages to live. These fears combine to cause Allie to hallucinate. In the supermarket, she keeps seeing various people with clown masks and even throws wine bottles at them before fleeing in panic like a chicken. Once in the car, she calls her partner Ivy, only to find a clown there too. When Ivy gets off work and comes home, he tells Allie that the police reviewed the surveillance footage, and it shows that she was the only one causing a commotion in the supermarket, screaming and throwing wine bottles. Allie believes she's being targeted. Ivy has opened her own barbecue restaurant, which is quite large, so the couple seems to be doing well financially. After leaving the restaurant while discussing the American election, they are suddenly accosted by Anderson, who throws coffee at them, curses, and leaves. The couple, not wanting to make a scene, decide to just chalk it up to bad luck. Meanwhile, Winter came to Allie's home to apply for a nanny position. Because she was quite attractive and approachable, the couple agreed to hire her. However, unknown to them, Winter had already been influenced by her brother Anderson and harbored a dark heart. One day, Anderson went to a gathering place for foreign workers and deliberately provoked them, resulting in him getting beaten up, bloodied from head to toe. Back at Allie's home, only Oz and Winter were present. Winter noticed Oz drawing pictures of the clown committing murders, and he was surprisingly good at it. Curiously, she asked if he had ever seen a real corpse. Oz naturally hadn't. Winter then exposed him to some age-restricted websites. While they were browsing, Oz heard a noise outside the window. Peering out, he saw several people wearing clown masks getting out of a van and entering the house of the neighbor across the street. Afterward, Allie and Ivy returned from the restaurant to find the police had cordoned off the area. Thankfully, their son Oz was safe. Oz informed them that the next-door neighbor had been killed. He claimed that he and Winter saw the assailants were the clowns. It turned out that Oz had called Winter for help, and surprisingly, she took him outside the neighbor's house to see what was happening. They discovered that after killing the neighbor, the councilman's entire family, the culprits had drawn a clown's face on the door. The clowns also spotted Oz, frightening him into running away. 
But after Oz finished recounting the events, Winter claimed that Oz was lying. She insisted that by the time they went outside, the police had already arrived. She then showed Oz's clown comic to the parents. They chose to believe Winter, considering Oz's history of night terrors and his tendency to lie. That night, Allie was terrified and couldn't sleep. She thought she saw a clown again and urgently called for Ivy. However, after a thorough search, the couple found nothing, and Allie began to wonder if she might indeed have a problem. At the same time, Oz was experiencing a bout of his night terrors, haunted by visions of terrifying clowns. His loud scream attracted the attention of his parents. Allie wanted to comfort Oz, but he said he wanted his mother, which caused Allie considerable heartache. It seemed that Ivy might actually be Oz's real mother. Anderson had been beaten up and was sent to the hospital. Meanwhile, the video of his beating was uploaded online. The attackers were foreigners, and as a result, they were swiftly deported. Since Trump's rise to power, his administration has had a particular aversion to illegal immigrants, even going so far as to build a wall. Anderson, therefore, gave an interview, pointing to his face and saying, It's not so safe here anymore, and the non-Americans should be deported. He announced his intentions to run for council, eyeing the position left vacant by the councilman's death. This led to suspicions that Anderson's organization might have been behind the councilman's murder. The day after the councilman's death, a new couple moved in next door. They were seen moving several large barrels into their home, and one of them was even wearing a hazmat suit, which was quite alarming. Allie sneaked a peek and happened to see the person in the hazmat suit come out, which scared her into rushing back home. In Ivy's restaurant, the manager sometimes treated foreigners with prejudice, like that day when he had a disagreement with the chef, who was clearly an immigrant. At home, Winter not only gave Oz a toy with Twisty the Clown, but also tried to tempt Oz with Anderson's manipulative tactics. When Allie and Ivy returned home, Winter mentioned that Oz was playing at the new neighbor's house, prompting them to hurry over. The man in the hazmat suit named Harrison explained that they were just the new neighbors who'd moved in, not sure why she was so cautious around them. It turns out he wasn't wearing a hazmat suit, but protective clothing for beekeeping, which he did in the backyard. Besides selling honey, Harrison was also a fitness coach. Harrison's wife, Meadow, the woman wearing a hat and sunglasses, suffered from skin cancer and couldn't be exposed to the sun for extended periods. Upon entering the house, Meadow said that when she and her husband saw that this house was for sale, they bought it right away and didn't care about the murder case at all. Thanks to that incident, they got the house for such a bargain. Although they were a married couple, Harrison was gay, so their relationship was more like best friends. They had made a pact in high school that if they were both single at 35, they'd marry each other, and they did. They got along quite harmoniously. Winter was always cautious around them, so after a brief chat, she hurried back home. That night, Oz was too scared to sleep alone, so he decided to squeeze in with his two moms. Then the alarm from Ivy's barbecue restaurant went off on her phone. She didn't pay much attention to the alarm, as it was often a false alert, but it couldn't keep ringing. It had to be switched off. Knowing that Oz was very attached to Ivy, Allie volunteered to go to the barbecue place to shut off the alarm. After turning off the alarm in the restaurant, Allie heard some noise from the kitchen and cautiously went to investigate. The sight of pig's blood on the floor sapped her courage. As she retreated in fear, she bumped into the restaurant manager who was hung up like a pig, still alive, but not for long. With her fear of blood, Allie wanted to help, but was too paralyzed by fear to do anything. Eventually, the manager died. The police launched an investigation. The detective pointed out that the chef had an argument with the restaurant manager the day before, making him a prime suspect. However, Ivy defended the chef, asserting that his character had been impeccable since the beginning of the restaurant, and he was not the killer. After these terrifying incidents, Allie felt overwhelmed. She not only installed iron bars outside her door, but also asked Harrison for a gun. Harrison had been stockpiling a variety of firearms and ammunition ever since Obama's presidency, which also touched upon some political issues. One day, Anderson actually approached Allie. She recognized him because he had once thrown coffee on her. Anderson was campaigning for a seat in the legislature, trying to win votes. He said she had a 40% chance of being a victim of violent crime by illegal immigrants and asked her to vote for him because he could make her feel safe. Allie didn't think immigrants were that scary, so she quickly shut the door on him. Winter noticed that Allie was especially anxious and advised her to take a bath and relax. While Allie was taking a bath, Winter came in and began to seduce her, saying she wouldn't tell Ivy, just close her eyes and enjoy. 
Suddenly, the alarm went off and the lights went out. Oz also saw a clown and wondered if he was hallucinating and dreaming. The clown told him to keep dreaming and go back to sleep. And so Oz did just that. At that moment, Harrison came to the door and told Allie that there was a power outage in eight states, probably due to a terrorist attack, and advised them to stay inside. On hearing about the terror attack, Winter said she had to go back to get her things. Allie asked her not to leave because she would be scared being alone. Winter replied that it was necessary, worrying about her possessions being stolen, and left, despite Allie's protests. Allie then called Ivy, but before they could talk much, her phone battery unhelpfully died. Ivy was busy with a lot of work, so she asked the chef to deliver a charger to Allie. It was at that moment that Allie noticed a truck outside the window, the same clown car Oz had seen that night. She realized that the wires in the home's alarm system had been deliberately cut, proof that someone had entered the house. Suddenly, a clown appeared and blew out the candle. The screen went black and various terrifying clowns entered the house. Allie quickly grabbed the borrowed gun, woke up Oz, and prepared to run to the neighbor's house. When someone appeared at the front door, Allie fired a shot. It turned out to be the chef coming to deliver the charger. Tragically, he didn't deliver the charger, but ended up being delivered to heaven. The police determined that Allie's actions were legal self-defense and she escaped legal punishment. Although she was not charged, Allie was left with a sense of guilt, having killed an innocent person with her own hands and in front of her son, no less. Additionally, because the chef was Latino, there were regular gatherings of immigrant groups outside the restaurant demanding Ally take legal responsibility, which severely affected Ivy's business. Anderson found an opportunity and leaned on Allie's car window. He reassured her by saying she had not done anything wrong and she was legally protecting her family. Harrison and Meadow also felt that Allie's actions were wrong. They paid her a visit to express their concerns in no uncertain terms. Meanwhile, another murder had occurred nearby. A young couple was found sealed in a coffin, already decomposed by the time they were discovered. More chillingly, a clown pattern was drawn on their glass door, implicating the same clown gang in the crime. Allie was horrified to notice a strange car passing outside her window the previous night, spewing green gas. The next day, the yard was littered with dead birds, clearly linked to the mysterious gas-emitting vehicle from the night before. Allie wondered if it was a terrorist attack. While discussing this, Winter showed up. Allie confronted her for abandoning her the previous night. Ivy defended herself, saying she was scared too. It was then that Allie forgave her. The next day, a large crowd of immigrants continued to cause a disturbance. Anderson appeared and managed to disperse the crowd with just a few words. He then reassured Allie that he would help her. That evening, Allie came home to find Oz cuddling a cute guinea pig, a gift from their neighbor, Harrison. However, Allie wouldn't let him keep it because she was highly allergic to dander. Oz left, feeling quite upset. Allie called Harrison to question why he would give such a gift. Harrison retorted that he might dislike her, but he liked her son. It was noticed that the detective was chatting with them, indicating that these people might be friends. Just then, the poison gas car appeared again. Allie rushed out to stop it, but the car seemed not to see her and nearly ran her over. After picking herself up from the ground, she realized her nose was bleeding, likely a result of inhaling the green gas, but thankfully, it was nothing serious. The scene shifts to Meadow and Anderson, who are making a pinky promise. Unexpectedly, she has a private connection with Anderson. He's particularly persuasive, and it's clear that Meadow is also under his spell. Oz and his parents enjoyed a meal at a barbecue restaurant, after which Allie told Oz he could keep the guinea pig, making him incredibly happy and reconciling their relationship. When they returned home, they were shocked to find a clown symbol painted on their front door and the guinea pig dead in the microwave. Allie suspected their neighbor Harrison was responsible, so she stormed into his house and punched him. But Harrison denied it, exclaiming he wouldn't waste time drawing on her door. Ivy thought Allie was being unreasonable and was starting to get annoyed with her. As they were arguing, Oz pointed out that the neighbor's wall also had a clown symbol on it. Allie suggested they might have drawn it themselves, which made Ivy think she was being completely irrational. Just then, Allie saw the gas car again. This time, someone got out and began spraying something on the lawn. Allie confronted him, demanding to know what he was spraying. The person removed their mask to reveal a clown mask underneath, which scared Allie into collapsing on the ground. The scene changes again. Unexpectedly, Harrison also has a private relationship with Anderson. Anderson noticed his disdain for his wife Meadow and asked if he wanted her dead, to which Harrison replied affirmatively. Allie called over the detective to explain all these strange events. 
The detective suggested they install surveillance cameras. Suddenly, Oz screamed. He had clicked on a link he shouldn't have. Ivy looked and was shocked to see high-definition footage of Winter giving Allie a tongue massage. Ivy slapped Allie, accusing her of infidelity with the nanny despite tolerating all her quirks. Allie urged her not to rush to judgment, emphasizing that the real issue was that someone had installed cameras in their home. Ivy didn't want to hear any explanations and prepared to leave with Oz. At that moment, they heard a commotion outside. They went to check and found that Meadow was dead. Harrison immediately pointed the finger at Allie, urging her capture. Accusing her of playing the victim, they turned around to see Oz had run into the neighbor's house. Inside, they found blood everywhere and another clown symbol on the wall. It appeared that there was an evil clown organization in town. Anderson seemed to be the leader, with Harrison Meadow and his sister Winter likely members. Of course, there are more mysteries to unravel. The time flashes back to a snowy night on November 8, 2016. At this juncture, Donald Trump had yet to be elected. Beverly, a reporter, was on the scene covering the news of the public voting. After delivering a lengthy report, she abruptly called for a retake, realizing she had omitted a detail. The cameraman advised against it, mentioning that their boss had declared they would not broadcast any election content tonight. Puzzled, Beverly questioned what they had been doing all this time. At that moment, her rival colleague passed by. The voting line was long, with all the main characters from the last episode waiting in queue. Allie and Ivy planned to vote for Hillary together, but Allie, for personal reasons, secretly voted for Jill, which later infuriated Ivy. In the midst of the polling chaos, Anderson hurried in with a bearded man who was bleeding, but insisted he's okay and just let him vote. It's his right. The man shakily cast his vote for Trump, then raised his arm to cheer for Trump's triumph, revealing a neatly severed hand. The following day, Anderson headed to the gym with a clear agenda to sweet-talk Harrison into joining his cult. With little effort, Harrison was swayed to join the clown organization, and under Anderson's influence killed his boss who had been bullying him. Meadow arrived home to find Harrison and Anderson handling the corpse, remaining eerily calm and remarking, life is just a pile of crap, and thus Meadow was inducted into the clown organization. The body was discarded at the landfill and promptly discovered. Beverly was tasked with reporting the incident, and she couldn't help but complain on her way there, wondering if her boss would have sent her rival colleague to such a stinking sight or just her. The scene shifts to the rival colleague reporting on a new foot massage service, flirting occasionally. It was evident that she had climbed the ladder by her sexy body. Anderson, watching Beverly's report at home, was caught by her offhand remark about the good feeling of being back. He rewatched the video several times, picking up on Beverly's underlying discontent. So, regardless of the kind of person Anderson might be, his perceptiveness is undeniable. He then looked up Beverly's background online and found that while she was reporting, people would often mock her skin color. Once she snapped and assaulted one of them. This incident even spawned a remix video of Beverly's story. Following this, Beverly voluntarily underwent 30 days of psychological therapy to avoid losing her job. During this period, the rival colleague took her place, which led to Beverly's remark about the good feeling of being back. The rival colleague is being flirted with by their boss. Suddenly, Beverly barges in and interrupts their smelly business. The boss then tells her that they are cutting her segment by a minute for this report and make the rival colleague continue with the report on the foot massage service. Beverly is taken aback, asking if that is even news. The boss retorts that as long as the viewers like it, that's what matters. Later that evening, Beverly takes a knife and stabs the rival colleague's car tires. At that moment, Anderson appears and says she's doing it wrong, and she should slash the tires like this. After Beverly finishes with the tires, Anderson invites her for a coffee. With only a few words, he starts to influence her, his words hitting right where it hurts. Before leaving, he hands her a business card and says if she wants to join them, come find him. Beverly had already been contemplating joining, but she needed a final push. That push would come with the rival colleague's death. While the rival colleague is reporting, three clowns suddenly appear behind her and kill both her and the cameraman before leaving. It's clear that these three are Anderson, Harrison, and Meadow. Beverly arrives at the scene and Anderson tells her there's no need for thanks, claiming he did it all for her. And so, Beverly joins the clown organization. From then on, whenever the clown organization commits a murder, Beverly is the first to report on it, constantly setting the tone and blaming the government for all the sources of fear. The scene flashes back to the day before the election night. Ivy gets into an argument over political differences with the same bearded man who showed up in the vote with a severed hand. The argument escalates until the man attempts to shove Ivy. 
That's when Winter steps in, helps Ivy, and drives the bearded man away. Afterwards, Ivy invites Winter to her barbecue restaurant for a meal. It's clear that the two had known each other already, sharing their life experiences and political views. But it seems Winter might deliberately influence Ivy. The bearded man is a supermarket cashier. He plans to do one last check before heading home, but finds Winter there. Ivy appears from behind and tases the man, and the two of them tie him up in a secret basement. When Winter returns home, Anderson immediately notices that his sister has been up to no good. Winter honestly confesses everything. Anderson then goes to the bearded man, saying the election is about to end in an hour. The man cries out that the women didn't want him to vote. He pleads with Anderson that he has to vote. Anderson hands him a saw, leaving the man stunned as he realizes he can't saw off the handcuffs in time. Anderson begins to manipulate him, eventually convincing him to saw off his own hand. And that's how we get to the story of the bearded man voting that we started with. Time returns to the present. Beverly has reported on the disappearance of Meadow. It turns out Meadow isn't dead, just missing. The boss questions Beverly that something is off about the data in her report. The crime rate in their town is decreasing, yet her report suggests a spike of over 40%. He wonders how she could always be the first one on the scene. Beverly responds with pride, saying she is just dedicated and she has her special sources. The boss is enough of her bullshit and decides to fire her. Unfazed, Beverly threatens to expose his dirty little secrets with the rival colleague. Consequently, the boss withdraws his decision and sends Beverly away. The scene shifts to Anderson and his group discussing election strategies, all members of the clown cult. In addition to the members we already know, the detective is indeed one of them. As they converse, Ivy arrives late, apparently now a member of the clown organization. This revelation connects the dots. The clowns that Ali has seen were not hallucinations, but rather this group tormenting her. Anderson comments that the fear they've created is insufficient. After the next murder, they will all shout, Hail Satan in Latin, and it must be recorded, to hint at religious involvement, escalating the terror to a new level. After Ivy moves away from Oz, Allie's anxiety intensifies. She consulted a psychologist named Dr. Rudy that day. That evening, the clown organization plots to assassinate Beverly's boss. Following their cry of Hail Satan, they prepare for the deed. The boss interjects, saying that he has a sex slave hidden in the basement. They find a man there, hooded, raising questions about the boss's sexual orientation. Not only does he flirt with the rival colleague at the office, but he also harbors a male prostitute. One of them suggests since the man is hooded and likely can't see them, they should let him go. Anderson, however, decides to kill the male prostitute anyway. Witnessing murder for the first time, Ivy is so appalled that she rushes to the restroom to vomit. In the end, Beverly axes her boss, settling a deep vendetta. She then reports on the murder as if nothing happened. Inside Ivy's barbecue restaurant, Anderson remarks to Beverly that he never thought that Ivy, who slices meat daily, would fear killing. Beverly concludes by saying timid people cannot achieve great things. Anderson mentions the member who intended to free the prostitute, saying that they might as well do away with him too. Last night, Allie was at home alone when, through the window, she shockingly saw Harrison hauling a sack into the house. Then the detective appeared, and it turned out the two of them were having an affair. Driven by curiosity and concern, Allie bravely went to investigate Harrison's house by herself. In the yard, she discovered a large, deep pit where Meadow was about to be buried alive. Allie was terrified and unable to save her, ran back home to call Ivy and relay the incident. Ivy feigned ignorance, suggesting that Allie's hallucinations were acting up again and offered to contact Dr. Rudy for help. Suddenly, Meadow appeared at the window crying for help and revealing that in the cult, the detective, her husband Ivy, and their nanny Winter were all members. While speaking, Meadow was snatched up in a sack once more. In a panic, Allie hung up the phone. Meanwhile, Ivy was at Harrison's place, where everyone was discussing election matters. Anderson's approval rating had shot up by 10 percentage points, and success seemed imminent. Anderson declared that they must eliminate any internal opposition before succeeding. He bound that member and ordered everyone to hammer a nail into his head, testing the other's loyalty. Consequently, the member was tortured to death by the group. The scene then shifts to show Anderson's background. His father had an accident that cost him his legs, turning him into an extremely cruel person. One day his mother couldn't take it anymore, so she shot his father dead and then ended her own life with the gun. This tragedy left Anderson helpless, so he called his elder brother for assistance. It turns out he had an elder brother that has been shown earlier. It's Dr. Rudy, Allie's psychologist. 
Rudy acted decisively, suggesting they throw their parents' bodies on the bed, cover them with lime to mask the smell, and keep the death a secret. Anderson was astonished and asked why. Rudy explained that they relied on their father's welfare and accidental insurance for living. If word of his death got out, they would lose that income. So the bodies of their parents were stored in the room and remain there to this day, with Anderson occasionally visiting to have a chat with his deceased parents. Back to the present, Ali suddenly received a call from Dr. Rudy. He said he was asked by Ivy to get in touch with Ali. So Ali recounted to him what Meadow had said, unaware that Dr. Rudy was also a cult member. After hanging up the phone, Ali armed herself with a knife and sneaked into Harrison's house, where she found Meadow in a storeroom and rescued her. The two of them ended up at a barbecue joint where Meadow spilled the beans about how they've been driving Ali insane all this time. Meadow confessed she had fallen for Anderson, who seemed to reciprocate her feelings. However, she was shocked when she accidentally discovered that he was also cozy with Ivy, and she realized that this was just one of Anderson's manipulative tactics. In a fit of rage, she decided to leave the organization, which led to her being punished and thrown into the pit. Allie suggested getting Meadow to her psychologist for protection, but Meadow believed the only way to deal with Anderson was to eliminate him. During Anderson's smooth campaign for election, someone stepped forward to challenge him as his rival candidate. After her speech, she surprisingly garnered much support, making her a formidable opponent for Anderson. The scene shifts to Anderson and Ivy making a pinky promise, a situation where lying isn't allowed. Ivy revealed that the son she has with Allie was indeed birthed by Allie. Her growing hatred for Allie stemmed from feeling like a stranger and completely insignificant after Oz was born. Anderson suggested they find a way to strip Allie of her parental rights, which was why everyone wanted to drive her mad. Allie went to Anderson's rival candidate and laid everything out, hoping she would hold a press conference to expose Anderson. But the rival candidate was skeptical. In the midst of their conversation, the clown cult burst in. Allie quickly hid in the bathroom and managed to escape. The rival candidate was brutally killed by Anderson. Allie didn't stop. She went straight to Dr. Rudy, urging him to take action. But Dr. Rudy said that the girl Meadow she brought hasn't said anything about a cult, so he thought all of this was just her hallucinations. Maybe she should consider checking into a mental hospital. Allie cursed him and left in anger. On the following day, Anderson resumed his speech in the square. Allie was there too, just for the thrill of it. It was then she saw Meadow in the crowd, pulling out a gun and firing, killing someone instantly. Anderson was next, shot in the leg, then three more fell in quick succession. Allie charged in wrestling with the handgun, but Meadow was stronger and managed to turn the gun on herself, firing the final shot. Before dying, she mumbled, this is true love. The gun ended up in Allie's possession, and naturally the police mistook her for a terrorist and arrested her. The time rewinds to when Meadow decided to leave the clown cult. Anderson told her the one he truly loves is her. Punishing her was just an act, part of the play. Now he needs her to murder him because his reputation will soar because his death will prove he was right. He also instructed her to divulge their cult's secrets to Allie, saying the police wouldn't believe a madwoman. Out of her absolute love for Anderson, Meadow was willing to sacrifice her own life to aid his rise to power. So all of this was orchestrated by Anderson, and Meadow followed his instructions. Lying injured on the stretcher, Anderson knew he had successfully secured his election as a member of parliament. And now, Allie, the only outsider privy to the truth, was locked away in prison, and possibly no one would believe what she said. Following the failed assassination of Anderson, his fame peaked, and he even received a retweet from Trump himself. However, not everyone was pleased, especially Beverly, who was promised a share of power after the success. But Anderson showed no intention of sharing. As Beverly prepared to drive away, she saw a figure in a black cloak waiting for her. It's a granny smoking a pipe. The granny said if she needed help, come find her in room 12 at the Reunion Hotel. The next day, Beverly confronted Anderson if everything he promised to her was just hot air. Ignoring her, Anderson mentioned other business and left. Feeling betrayed, Beverly harbored resentment. At the barbecue restaurant, Ivy and Winter were present, along with Beverly who brought the granny. The granny introduced them to a formidable woman whose name is Valerie, and she was the lover of the granny and the leader of a cult. Back to the year 1967, Valerie was delivering a speech. She founded an organization dedicated to opposing the patriarchal society, which aimed to kill all men. The anti-men society allowed men to join, but they had to vow their loyalty and pass its test. Therefore, it can also be considered a cult. Soon, they began to murder, with David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen being among their victims. 
Winter was shocked, asking if those two were the first victims of the Zodiac Killer. The granny clarified that they were exactly the Zodiac Killer. For the background, the Zodiac Killer had killed 37 victims and would leave codes with each murder for the police to solve, and even sent them a letter filled with strange symbols. To this day, the identity of the killer remains unknown, and no one has cracked the codes. But the granny revealed that the codes were nonsense, randomly written by them. People even started to imitate them, sending their own coded letters to the police, which infuriated Valerie as her group's work was being stolen. In 1973, Valerie discovered that it was their own member, some man within the anti-men society, sending these codes to the police. The imposter was brutally silenced. The next day, Valerie boldly informed the police that the anti-men society was the Zodiac and she was the boss. She even declared that killing is their glory and no one is allowed to impersonate them. However, the police thought she was a fool and threw her out, which made her very angry. She then began to plan murders more frenetically and even made a list of people to kill. Gradually, Valerie descended into madness and eventually died, tormented by her own delusions. Now, although Valerie passed away, the spirit of the anti-men society lived on through the granny, who could now be considered the new leader of the society. A few days later, Anderson found a manifesto of the anti-men society in Winter's house and asked what it was. Winter dismissed it as just a novel. Anderson remarked that it was well-written and thought-provoking. He had come this far on personal charm, but it was not enough and he too needed a manifesto, with a catchy title in his cult. Winter asked if that meant he planned to write a book. Anderson replied that he didn't have time at the moment but could start with a name, such as the Society of True Fear, because he thought fear is the truth. In the evening, Ivy lured Harrison into a BBQ restaurant where several women surrounded him. After the granny recited the Anti-Men Society's manifesto, the group brutally dismembered Harrison. It seems these ladies have joined the Anti-Men Society. The next day, Beverly was the first to report the murder. Anderson knew right away what had happened. After turning off the TV, he remarked how frightening their anger could be. Then, turning to his side, he saw the granny was also there, who added, they were all like that. It appears that Anderson is also a member of the Anti-Men Society. A few days later, Dr. Rudy came to see Anderson to celebrate his successful election as a counselor. Anderson revealed to him that the person who wanted him dead was also Rudy's patient, referring to Meadow, who was introduced by Allie and treated by Rudy. Dr. Rudy admitted he felt somewhat ashamed for not knowing about Anderson's candidacy and expressed his pride. Anderson insisted he should call him councilman from today on. The scene shifts to a group wearing blue clothes, feasting and drinking in the BBQ restaurant. Ivy couldn't take it anymore, complaining that her own restaurant made her feel like a waiter. These people in blue were nothing but Anderson's henchmen, and what's more, it was legal because their presence was decided by a vote in the House of Representatives. Of course, some were persuaded by threats and bribes. On the other side, Allie is finally released from the psychiatric hospital. Thanks to the numerous cameras at the scene of the attack, it was clear that Allie wasn't the assailant. Dr. Rudy rushed to Allie's house as soon as he could, telling her that he now believed her, that Anderson was even more dangerous than she had imagined. Allie was taken aback, as if Dr. Rudy knew him well. Rudy confirmed that he did indeed know Anderson and produced a family photo showing the three of them together. Only then did Allie realize that Anderson and Winter were Rudy's siblings, which cast Rudy in a not-so-villainous light. Rudy offered to help expose Anderson and have him committed to a psychiatric hospital. That night, Allie couldn't sleep, missing her son Oz terribly. This longing miraculously cured her of all her phobias, transforming her into a much braver person. She decided to rescue her son. The next day, she invited Anderson over, who brought bodyguards, fearing an attack. Allie told him she had information he wanted but wouldn't provide it for free. She demanded her son Oz back in exchange for the news. After the exchange, she even made Anderson a hamburger, which he ate confidently, knowing Allie meant him no harm. Meanwhile, Winter continued to fulfill the duties of the anti-men society by killing the detective. Later, Anderson kidnaps both Rudy and Beverly. He confronts Rudy, saying he heard Rudy wanted to take him down. Dr. Rudy is shocked, realizing Allie must have spilled the beans, and then he is ruthlessly killed by Anderson. The fact that Anderson could even kill his own brother showed he was beyond redemption. Beverly was tied up because Winter had framed her for the death of the detective. Knowing she couldn't escape her fate, Beverly boldly asked to be killed, but Anderson showed unexpected mercy and spared her. 
After dealing with these events, Anderson welcomed a new member to his cult. To everyone's shock, the new member was Allie. This put Ivy in an awkward position. Anderson captured his followers by storytelling, making them worship him, and over time he cultivated a group willing to die for him. Whenever there was a meeting in the council hall, Anderson would bring his followers, and anyone who resisted would be beaten into submission. Basically, Anderson had the final say in everything. Anderson announced his intentions to run for a seat in the U.S. Senate, which was met with cheers from his followers. Allie asked Ivy why she had joined a cult and why she had torn their family apart. Ivy was at a loss for words and seemed to regret her actions. Allie told her she was there to help her escape from this tormented life. As they were talking, Oz was brought to them. Allie promised her son that she'd never leave him again and gave him a comic book about clowns. Oz asked if she was no longer afraid of clowns, to which Allie confirmed she wasn't. So the reason Allie betrayed Dr. Rudy was to infiltrate the cult. Winter also arrived, and the three planned their escape. Just then, someone knocked on the door. It was Anderson's followers, who announced that their group had called an emergency meeting. It was time to go. The trio arrived at the meeting location. After a while, Beverly burst in and started fighting Winter because she had previously betrayed her. Anderson appeared and proclaimed that it was time for them to enter a new phase, death. He had prepared a large vat of poisonous drink, insisting that everyone must consume it, and death is to transcend the physical and achieve rebirth. Essentially, he was still peddling the same old spiel, akin to the real-world tales of achieving immortality through self-immolation. Just then, one of the henchmen objected, questioning the logic of a ritual that actually involved dying. Anderson, without hesitating, shot him dead. Beverly was the first to drink the concoction. Anderson continued his persuasive speech, saying this revolutionary act would be remembered by the whole world forever. The rest followed suit and drank, Anderson included. After they finished, Anderson asked how they liked the new cola flavor. It turned out that the supposed poison was nothing more than a test of loyalty to his group. The next day, Allie and Ivy decided to pick up Oz from school and make a run for it. However, to their surprise, Oz had already been taken away. They rushed to Anderson's place, attacking anyone they encountered while demanding to know where their son was. They finally found Oz in the basement, only for Anderson to claim that Oz was his son too. He claimed that according to his investigation, he donated his sperm to the Prague clinic where Allie was inseminated, and that meant Oz is his son. Allie was shocked, fearing that Oz might inherit Anderson's terrifying genes. Regardless, she decided to take Oz and leave, but of course it wasn't that easy. Oz wanted to stay because of all the toys. Allie reasoned that since Anderson was convinced of his paternity, Oz's safety was likely not in danger. Returning home that evening, Allie opened a bottle of red wine and decided to reconcile with Ivy, who happily agreed. After a couple of sips, however, Ivy collapsed, dead. It turned out that Allie had poisoned the wine. She had become ruthless, saying Ivy led Oz astray and once tried to drive her mad. She cannot let Ivy interfere with her plans. After dealing with Ivy, Allie went to the Prague clinic and requested to see information about Oz's father. Initially, the doctor refused, citing the privacy of the sperm donors. Allie then handed over a hefty bribe, and the doctor produced the father's information. Upon seeing the documents, Allie realized that Anderson was not the father after all. She then asked the doctor to help her forge a document. Last night, she invited Anderson over to her house. When Anderson asked about Ivy, Allie admitted that she had killed her partner because she planned to kill Anderson next. Anderson then asked her if she wanted to kill him as well. Allie replied that she couldn't possibly want to kill Oz's biological father. She then showed Anderson the forged documents. Anderson was thrilled, realizing that he really is Oz's dad. He was overjoyed, believing that someone would carry on his crusade. It seemed they were even planning to live as a family. It was clear that Allie was the truly frightening one. The next day, Anderson was giving a speech in the square when suddenly a group burst in, carrying anti-fascist signs. They didn't hesitate to beat up Anderson and his followers. After this incident, Anderson became paranoid, convinced that the FBI was monitoring his home. He couldn't fathom having any opposition. The beating was all over the TV, with another senator dismissing Anderson as nothing more than a jerk, completely undermining him. Enraged, Anderson declared they needed to do something that will shock the world, something that will shake the very foundations of culture. Only then can they enter the Senate and eventually take the presidency. Anderson planned to orchestrate a mass murder involving a thousand pregnant women. 
That night, the bearded man, accompanied by a few others, went to a family planning center where a long line of pregnant girls awaited removal surgeries. He planned to steal a list to prepare for Anderson's mass murder plot. But just as they entered, Anderson appeared, telling the bearded man that he needed to die for him. Hearing this, the man willingly accepted his fate, ending his bearded life. The next day, Beverly began reporting on the bearded man's murder, giving Anderson a platform to speak. Anderson called the bearded man his dear friend and prayed that the senator who had criticized him and the left-wing terrorists he supported would face justice. When Beverly asked if he thought another senator was responsible for the murder, Anderson affirmed it. Once the cameras were off, Anderson turned to Beverly, saying her report lacked enthusiasm and it's like the weather forecast. Beverly returned to the barbecue joint and spoke to Winter, saying ever since she drank that non-poisonous drink last time, she felt like she had been trapped in a cage. Winter handed her a train ticket and told her to run away. But Beverly declared that she would never flee, and she unconditionally submitted to Anderson's rule. It seemed Beverly had lost her grip on reality. Anderson was rummaging through his house, insisting he could hear a buzzing noise and suspecting someone had planted bugs in his home. Allie told him there were no sounds and suggested he was under too much stress. Anderson started to hallucinate, even seeing his brother Rudy come back to life. Rudy told Anderson to keep it up because he was the one who could bring great chaos to the world. But before he could finish, someone killed Rudy. Of course, all of this was Anderson's fantasy. The man who killed Rudy said Anderson should be imagining him instead. This person was Charles Manson, also a figment of Anderson's imagination and a notorious cult leader whom Anderson had always admired. Allie came to Anderson with a listening device and said she found this in the room, so it's clear they have a mole in the house. Right then, the granny confronted Anderson, questioning why he would want to plot the murder of a thousand pregnant women, accusing him of betraying the principles of the anti-men society. She added that Valerie entrusted her with the revival of women's rights, but now Anderson was failing them. Behind her, the hallucination of Charles Manson appeared, urging Anderson to kill the granny. Anderson retorted he was the one who ruled over women. As the granny drew her pistol to shoot Anderson, Allie shot her from behind. The next day, Winter shaved Anderson's head. Anderson pulled out a train ticket and confronted Winter, asking why she wanted to leave him. Winter was at a loss for words. Allie mentioned the listening device found in Winter's car. Anderson then treated Winter as the traitorous mole, preparing to deal with his sister. Only then did Winter realize she had been framed. She told Allie her grand deceptions would catch up with her and she would have an ugly end and be killed like her. Allie replied that even if that's true, Winter wouldn't be around to see it. Then, with great sorrow, Anderson strangled Winter. At that moment, one of the henchmen sneaked away, ready to drive off with a listening device hidden on him. Suddenly, Allie also got in the car, and then the scene went black. Whether Allie came to help Anderson eliminate a mole, or to help the mole eliminate Anderson remains unknown. The scene shifts to Anderson, once again beguiling someone, this time a prison guard. Anderson does this because he is now in prison. The details of his incarceration will come later. With his remarkable gift of gab, he's won over a slew of followers inside. The Charles Manson spirit also sticks close to Anderson, a sign of his unraveling sanity. On this day, a cellmate joins, eager to be part of Anderson's holy mission, and Anderson gladly accepts him. The scene then flashbacks to 11 months prior, explaining how Anderson got locked up in prison. He had convinced his gang that they could kill 1,000 pregnant women, a boast too grand to fulfill, so they scaled it back to 100. Tonight was to be the night of their vile plan, killing pregnant women to fuel the fury of women everywhere, which would in turn be directed at another senator. If successful, Anderson might just win a seat in the Senate. Back at home, Allie chuckles to Beverly, saying Anderson's followers are quite something and tonight's bound to be thrilling. Beverly doesn't utter a word, just chops vegetables until she blurts out that she just wants to die and hands the knife to Allie, urging her to do the deed. Allie tells her to hold on, that it will all be over soon, and tonight is sure to be especially exciting. Beverly keeps chopping as Anderson bursts in, shouting that one of his men is gone, referring to the one previously bugged with a listening device. Anderson is afraid that man can be the traitor, realizing if their plan is discovered, he's off to the slammer. It seems the operation must be called off, but Allie reassures Anderson all will be fine, showing him the listener on the missing man, recounting the tale. 
It turns out that after Allie got on board, the man urgently whispered not to tell Anderson or he'd be a dead man. Allie asked why he had the listener and if he was an FBI mole. But the man denied it, claiming to be just a worker who'd been caught by the police at a party with 120 packs of hallucinogens. He was facing five years, but was offered a deal to infiltrate Anderson's cult and gather evidence to reduce his sentence. So the man was a kind of police informant. Allie asked if the device transmitted live. The man clarified it was just a recorder, not a transmitter. Relieved, Allie then killed the man. Upon hearing that, Anderson realized he had misunderstood his sister Winter. But what's done is done. All he could do was carry on the holy war to the bitter end. Anderson quickly organized a brief rally, then prepared to initiate a murder operation. It was at this moment that Allie left the house alone, approaching a truck filled with FBI agents. Allie declared that those wanting to capture Anderson should act now. It appeared that Allie was actually the real FBI undercover agent. As a result, Anderson was easily apprehended and consequently ended up in prison. Following these events, Allie gained notoriety and her barbecue restaurant thrived. One evening, Beverly visited Allie, sharing that Anderson had confessed to his past crimes without reservation. Due to his cooperative attitude, he surprisingly avoided the death penalty. Allie expressed indifference, asserting that Anderson could no longer stir up any trouble. Beverly wondered about her own fate, amazed that the police hadn't arrested her. Allie explained that she had told the police Beverly was a forced participant and a victim, so the police deemed her innocent. Allie then recounted her experiences after being admitted to a psychiatric hospital and how the FBI later approached her. It turns out, the FBI had long suspected Anderson but lacked evidence, so they hoped Allie could infiltrate the enemy's ranks, leading to subsequent events. However, Allie kept secret the fact that she had killed her partner Ivy and the issues with the police informant. Allie also found a new partner and seemed to be starting a better life. Afterwards, a reporter was ready to interview her, but Allie declined. She wanted to leave the past behind and start anew. Just then, Anderson called Allie from prison, threatening to kill her as soon as he got out. Allie defiantly responded, telling him to bring it on. A few days later, Allie surprisingly decided to run for the Senate. There was only one formidable opponent, and they were set to debate that very night. Meanwhile, Anderson in prison sought out the cellmate to act as his scapegoat. After killing him, Anderson and the converted prison guard disfigured the cellmate's face to stage Anderson's death in prison, allowing Anderson to escape easily. On the eve of the debate, Beverly informed Allie that Anderson was found dead in his cell, his face so badly damaged that he was unrecognizable. Both knew that Anderson had escaped the prison. Allie remarked that they had no other choice but to proceed with the debate. As the two were passionately debating, Anderson appeared with his followers, having taken a gun prepared by the prison guard. After hurling a few insults at Allie, he pulled the trigger, but the gun was not loaded. Anderson turned to the prison guard, who responded with a smug look. It turned out that Allie had already won over the prison guard with her cunning, turning him against Anderson. Anderson acknowledged her prowess, and Allie replied that, In this world, there's nothing more dangerous than a woman who's been provoked. Suddenly, with a loud bang, Beverly shot Anderson from behind. After this incident, Allie's approval soared over 80%, securing her election as a senator. That evening, after tucking Oz into bed and applying light makeup, Allie donned a black cloak and attended an all-women gathering. It seemed that Allie might have become the leader of this anti-men cult. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.